so shear design of beams is our topic very important force which is to be considered while designing the rc members putting in all structural members shear force we need to determine and then we need to know that how much is the capacity of concrete to resist that shear and if it exceeds the capacity of shear then we need to provide steel ties or rings or shear reinforcement to resist the demand of shear force which is in addition to the resistance which can be provided by the concrete so the philosophy is same that bu will be the ultimate shear force and that should be less than or maximum equal to the shear force resisted by the concrete so it means the internal resistance of concrete alone if it is concrete alone can provide the resistance greater than or minimum equal to the applied ultimate shear then we can say that we reach the safe resistance phi reduction factor for shear will be 0.75 so in flux shear we use 0.9 but in shear it will be more uh, strict considering the brittle type of failure the reduction will be more stringent so if concrete alone can't resist the demand then we need to add in it resistance provided by the steel so we will use vs as the notation for the shear force provided by the steel so in this way either we see concrete capacity alone or concrete plus shear together uh, concrete plus steel together along with the capacity reduction factor if it is equal to or greater than the demand ultimate shear force then the design will be okay in flagier design we did the same thing that we had ultimate movement demand and we determined the nominal resistance and then we multiplied it with the capacity reduction factor so in this way we got the resistance internal capacity equal to or greater than the demand and that m nominal we got by the internal couple between steel and concrete and in doubly beams between steel and concrete plus steel and steel tension and compression steel now this picture is a beam which has been tested in the laboratory by applying a point load right in the middle of the beam so when point load will be applied right in the middle of the beam and this point load is applied through jack and obviously gradually this load increased and finally a stage approached when the 
लोड ऑलमोस्ट अप्रोच द फेलियर लिमिट ऑफ द बीम इन शेयर सो वी यू अल्टीमेट शेयर फोर्स एक्चुअली वंस अप्रोच then the crack will finally result into the failure of the beam in shear if this vu is approached before the flugger failure of the beam and beam capacity in shear to resist the vu approached earlier than the capacity against flugger then shear failure will be governed in the beam by the beam there are other uh, possibilities as well that this beam will fail by shear or by flugger depending on some other factors which we want to discuss in today's lecture but at the moment i can simply describe that if i apply point load on this beam right in the middle we know that the due to that point load the bending moment diagram will be like this and if this point load is p then the moment at the mid span maximum moment at the mid span will be pl by 4 and against this movement if i have the p value with which is the demand on the beam that i am designing this beam for this pu so pu is given to me like uh, suppose if it is some value like 10 ton 10 ton means 100 kN if this is the point load ultimate point load which is to be resisted by this beam and i want to design this beam against it then i will be having the ultimate movement based on this pu pl pu l by 4 maximum movement at the mid span and against this movement i will design the beam and i will provide the flugural steel which you are well familiar with how to design the beam for against flugger so you will provide fluggerial steel some bars so maximum moment is at the mid span so this moment will be used to design this fluggerial steel you may even hook the bar at the end anchor them so this will be the main steel so this was our topic of discussion up till now that we only discussed what is the load whether udl or point load and, and against this what is the movement and then based on that movement we calculated the area of steel and then we detailed the beam accordingly first we proportioned it we selected the b width of the beam depth of the beam we decided the covers and then we provided the details of the reinforcement whether it is in one layer or two layers if it is doubly beam shallow beam then we need to provide additional steel also on top so mid span will again will have the maximum movement so we will have some steel in the top in the compression region which will give us additional force compression force in the steel bars in the compression region will make a couple with the component of the steel on the tension side if this beam will be designed as doubly 
so this is our this was our topic of discussion when we were talking about rectangular singly or doubly beams and we remained silent about the shear force now in this beam actually shear force is also present and if i draw the shear force diagram for this load conditions which is a point load i am not considering at the moment the self weight of the beam i am just looking at this point load so against this point load if i draw the shear force diagram just under that beam so the half of this pu i would say the reaction over here will then be pu by 2 simply supported beam so the shear force diagram will become like this so plus pu by 2 minus pu by 2 i am talking only about the point load right in the middle now this shear force pu by 2 which remains constant throughout the half of the depth of the beam with positive magnitude and the remaining half with negative sign whether this pu by 2 will control the failure or failure will be controlled by mu which is pu l by 4 so which capacity which will be the governing failure mode that is important as i said that if concrete alone has the strength more than pu by 2 it means ultimate shear force maximum shear force on this beam is the given pu i took the example of 10 ton 100 kN so it means 50 kN is the shear force if i am considering it as 10 ton or 100 kN so i will have the information about the span of the beam pl by 4 can give me moment now the shear force vu will be then 50 so if concrete alone can give me vc even by multiplying it with the capacity reduction factor a value suppose i am taking example 55 it is above the ultimate shear demand it means i need not to consider theoretically speaking the role of uh, providing steel stirrups because concrete alone can give me the capacity above 50 and furthermore when this uh, vu will be 50 my movement capacity at the mid span will give me the maximum movement and, and against that maximum movement i have designed my phalangeal steel so it means ultimate movement will approach first while the shear capacity even with concrete alone i am not consider uh, uh, considering the role of providing ties shear stirrups still concrete alone has the capacity even more than the ultimate demand on shear so in this way we can understand 
the interaction while making the design between flexure and shear said so that not only i'm here talking about flexure and then shear there will be additional twist or torsion may be present on end beams edge beams and against that torsion we also need to examine the resistance offered by the member and we may need to provide the additional steel if we know that the torsion will control the failure so we need to provide the reinforcement to design the beam against torsion so if i found out that vc 5vc is hardly suppose 30 kN then i need to add in it plus 5vs so that i can get the 20 more from the steel so in this way my vu will be become equal to the resistance offered by the concrete plus steel but then i have to provide the stirrups to get that vs so those ties which i will design against that surplus demand of 20 kN will be provided so this is what we want to discuss today how to design the ties against this additional demand of vu minus phi vc so today's topic is actually not only to determine the vu but also to determine the phi vc and then if it is less than vu then we want to calculate the difference and that additional shear force will be transferred to the steel stirrups and the magnitude what we want to get from the stirrups ultimate resistance will be phi vs since we are working on ultimate strength design so we will be using capacity reduction factors on the capacity side on the by putting reduction on the ultimate resistance and on the demand side we are using the load factors to increase the loads so this is our topic of discussion and first i will explain some background theory and then finally we will do one design problem where we want to apply the design methodology to design the beams for shear force so let's start from introduction on a homogeneous elastic and uncracked beams so reinforced concrete beams are neither homogeneous nor they remain elastic and uncracked but let's discuss first the shear stresses on a simple cross sections and then we want to 
actually apply the design method on reinforced concrete beams. Shear stresses is defined as the magnitude of the shear force acting parallel to the area divided by the area. So it means if you have the shear force diagram, like in on this previous slide, you have the shear force diagram and you know what is the shear force as you I, I have given you example 50 kilonewton if PU is 100. So this 50 divided by the effective area of the cross section which will be B into D will give me the shear stress on the cross section. So shear force if it is in our case we are selecting 50 kilonewton so 50 divided by b into d will give me shear stress so this is what they are saying is defined as the magnitude of the force acting parallel to the area divided by the area how to calculate the shear stress this stress is produced due to sliding of the various layers of the material on one another so when you will when beam will deform due to bending the various layers will slide which are in case of you can say reinforced concrete beams they it is a composite of steel and concrete but still there are layers of steel inside and then as well as concrete layers due to that bending they will tend to slide on one another in that heterogeneous beam even and as a result shear stresses are produced between layers shear stress along the depth of the cross section for homogeneous elastic uncracked beams may be calculated by using the equation so this equation to calculate the shear stress you have applied on a cross section which was homogeneous elastic and what variation in shear stress you got was based on this equation that maximum shear stress was at neutral axis unlike fluxural stress which is zero at neutral axis shear stress will be maximum at neutral axis and how we got that shear stress on homogeneous elastic uncracked beams we calculated the shear force on a cross section then we calculated first movement of area of the part of the section lying between the point where the shear is required and the nearest outermost fibers about the neutral axis the first movement of that area was calculated i in the denominator is the movement of inertia second mode of area of the cross section about the corresponding axis of bending and b is the width of the section at the location where shear stress is required so on homogeneous elastic uncracked sections you are well familiar how to determine the shear stress profile on a cross section at various layers you can determine the 
magnitude of shear stress and maximum will be at the neutral axis. The shear stress acting on the vertical sections are complementary to the horizontal shear stress in longitudinal direction of the beams. So I said in the on the second slide that due to sliding, shear stresses will uh, will develop sliding between various layers. And here in this bullet, it is stated that shear stress is acting on the vertical sections, which you can calculate by average shear stress by dividing the shear force with the effective area. I said V U over B D. That shear stress on the vertical face will be complemented by the horizontal shear stress in the longitudinal direction of the beam. At the neutral axis, a differential element has only the shear stresses and hence the principal axes are oriented at 45 degree to the longitudinal axis of the member as shown below. So this, in order to understand the first bullet was that vertical shear stresses are complemented by the horizontal shear stresses. So this you can calculate by dividing the shear force with the BD to get on vertical faces what are the shear stresses. And then on neutral axis, it is stated, take you to one picture that slide number nine, that this element is taken exactly on the neutral axis. And on the neutral axis, if this one is the neutral axis on, of a homogeneous elastic uncracked beam, which is right in the middle, there will not be any bending stress on the vertical face. There is no such stress present over here because it is neutral axis, it is zero. So only the shear forces are present and complemented by the horizontal one. If you want to determine the principal planes, you can get the principal diagonal tensile stresses and principal compressive stresses and on those principal planes shear stresses are zero. So these diagonal principal tensile stresses on the element one will cause actually that diagonal tension crack which we term as the shear crack. It will originate from the neutral axis because the maximum shear stresses are at the neutral axis. So normal to the diagonal tension crack will appear and that is the diagonal shear crack at orientation 45 degree. So this is what is explained here on that picture that if the diagonal tension is at 45 degree, so this element you can say is drawn. Suppose if I take one element over here. Exactly like it is on the left of the support. Now I am taking it on. Will be like this because the principal tension on this side will be. At 45 degree over here. And the compression will be. Over here. So the crack will be having orientation 
45 degree this one so as a matter of fact the uh, picture over here is like that one on the right of the support and normal to this crack is appearing and away from the neutral axis the principal stresses angle increases until it becomes horizontal on the tension face and decreases until it becomes vertical on the compression face now in order to understand this third bullet let me give you example of one element let me call it one and then let me call it two now below neutral axis we have the uh, i may say below the neutral axis or above the neutral axis uh, let me call it rather than two let me call it three because on the next picture they have taken one element below neutral axis and one if it is above neutral axis then on the vertical face there will be compression bending compressive stresses and below neutral axis there will be tension and on the vertical faces there will be bending tensile stresses so now this three element or the two element let me draw them this element two which is drawn here will have on the vertical face not only the shear stresses but also the bending tensile stresses which we are using uh, letter f or we can also put stress like this sigma f so if i have not only the shear stresses on the vertical face but also the bending tensile stresses if it is element 2 and if i take one element above the neutral axis and i call it element 3 which is given on the previous slide then on this vertical face i will have a compression bending compressive stresses are present and along with the shear stresses which are on the vertical faces and complementary on the horizontal so these are also present so element 3 has compression element 2 has tension on the vertical faces and accordingly once i want to calculate the principal planes I still get the principal plane, but at a little shallow angle than I got when I calculated it on the neutral axis, where the bending compressive or bending tensile stresses on the vertical faces are zero. So, this is what is explained on the beam by plotting the tension trajectories tension and compression trajectories that if element by element i will get the principal planes and i get also the, the diagonal tension its orientation and normal to it i can then draw the orientation of the crack which will be the which will be named as shear crack but actually the cause will be the diagonal tension and this solid lines which are drawn on this beam are actually the lines which are drawn by connecting these principal tensile stresses and very much on the neutral axis they are almost at 45 degree and as you move away from the support the angle is getting little milder and when 
you are near the mid the angle almost gets horizontal the reason is if i consider one element over here near the mid span shear force is negligible for even for this uh, beam which is simply supported and subjected to uniformly distributed load over here bending tensile stresses will be present and shear force is zero and these bending tensile stresses will become principal stresses because on the vertical faces or horizontal faces there are no shear stresses present and normal to this crack will form and the orientation of these principal stresses you will see is almost horizontal over here so as we are moving away from the mid span we are getting increase in the angle of principal tensile stresses and when we are close to support angle will get almost 45 degree similar to that i can also plot compression trajectories and i will find that if i will draw a i will draw on one element which is right in the middle on the vertical face there will be compression because bending compressive stresses are present and shear force are zero so the principal compression is almost horizontal and this dotted line also shows that this is almost having zero degree angle and as we move away from it corresponding to these angles the compression trajectories are also getting the orientation and near the support as the tension trajectory was at 45 degree same is the case of compression that it has the 90 degree angle between the compression and tension so that is they are orthogonal to each other so the compression trajectories and tension trajectories are plotted by taking the stresses on elements and investigating the principal planes so it is stated here at away from neutral axis the principal angle increases until it becomes horizontal on the tension phase and decreases until it becomes vertical on the compression phase the tensile stress trajectories appear as shown in the figures cracks also develop on the same pattern along the tensile principal stress paths so what is stated that for example let me read these bullets first and then i will relate them with the pictures near the supports cracks appear at almost 45 degree originating from neutral axis which quickly spread towards the two faces so this one so because the diagonal tension was this and concrete is weak in tension so normal to this diagonal crack appeared first and then it propagated 
and then it finally will start please uh, close your mic m so it start propagating and as mentioned in this uh, bullet near the supports cracks appear at almost 45 degree originating from neutral axis which quickly spread towards the two faces these cracks are called pure shear web or inclined shear cracks because as i said on vertical faces bending stresses are zero and pure shear is the cause of appearance of those cracks when these cracks extend toward the supports they weaken the anchorage of the main steel so as they are propagating and then they will start moving along the steel bars and debonding of the steel will take place and end anchorage will be weakened if you have provided hooks 90 degree hooks or 180 degree bends then you may get some extra anchorage but otherwise if bar is going straight into the support then the crack movement along the bars which were originated by the web shear will actually result into failure of the beam because of the slippage of the steel bars so when these cracks extend toward the supports they weaken the anchorage away from the supports but within length of the beam having shear force flagellar cracks appear first on the tension side penetrating vertically upwards so don't forget that on these beams bending movements you have calculated and if on this picture i consider that it is simply supported and subjected to a uniformly distributed load so maximum movement will be at the mid span and once you apply a load on the beam modes of rupture will come and tension crack will appear and with more and more load on the beam tension crack will also start propagating and movement of the neutral axis will also take place and there will be some region along the length of the beam where the flagellar cracks and the shear cracks will finally merge and we call them flagellar shear crack so they will here will propagate flagellar will propagate and then they will merge so we will have web shear cracks flagellar shear cracks and flagellar cracks so these three type of structural cracks will be present in the beams near the ultimate loads so finally the failure will be governed by flagellar or shear that is important question that failure mechanism was due to flagellar or due to shear obviously the flagellar failure will be ductile and we will prefer a beam to give a ductile flagellar failure rather than a brittle shear failure when the effective cross section reduces due to these cracks shear becomes dominant and the crack becomes inclined at angles closer to 45 degree 
also keep in mind that whether crack is flagral or shear the cross section is reduced now in this case the cross section left which is solid is only this one in this case it is this one so we are using b into d as the effective area in the denominator to calculate the shear stress or even in our flagial stresses we are using the effective area but once uh, cracks are moving and propagating our effective area is reducing and it is mentioned these cracks are termed as flagral shear cracks so actually this bullet is the continuity of the previous uh, statement which is here that away from the supports but within the length of the beam having shear force flagral cracks appear first on the tension side penetrating vertically upwards and then when the effective cross section reduces due to these flagral cracks shear becomes dominant because in shear you have vu over bd because area reduced so in the denominator area reduced so shear stress increased and then crack becomes which were earlier vertical flagral cracks become inclined at angle close to 45 degree so we term them flagral shear cracks the average shear stress along the depth of the beam we will calculate it by dividing the shear force with the effective area where v is the applied shear force and b is the width of the beam and d is the effective depth so this is the brief introduction of the different structural cracks in the beam flagral cracks flagral shear cracks or uh, diagonal tension or web shear cracks on what factors concrete shear strength depends on it depends on the compressive strength of concrete a good concrete will have a good durability it will have good shear strength stronger concrete will have good bond strength it will be considered good in that tensile strength as well so more compressive strength is also beneficial concrete shear strength also depends on movement to shear ratio m over v ratio and also on the effective depth so more movement means more flagral cracks so in the regions of maximum movement with more flagral cracks what will happen the cross sectional area will reduce so that means that we must keep in mind that in beams movement as well as shear force both are present and they are going to affect the shear strength of the beam along with the effective depth the ratio of m over v we want to discuss on next slides that how it will affect our strength of concrete in shear resistance longitudinal reinforcement ratio rho also affects the concrete shear strength so on these three factors now one by one 
we want to discuss few important points greater concrete strength usually corresponds to more tensile and shear strength and this stated vc will be proportional to square root of fc prime this remains true even after initial cracking of the concrete at certain locations the maximum value of the uh, the maximum value of the concrete strength fc prime under root you please add here allowed by the aci code is 8.3 megapascal except in pre stressed concrete beams and joists so it means the equations what we are going to discuss will remain applicable when fc prime you are using in your members is up to 69 megapascal because under root of 69 will be 8.3 megapascal so limited data is available on concrete grades above 8.3 with regard to shear strength so the equations which are proposed in the aci code will remain applicable when you are taking under root of fc prime maximum equal to 8.3 so even if you have 100 mega pascal concrete under root of fc prime will become 10 in r to apply these equations you will reduce that 10 to 8.3 so maximum allowed value to be used in these equations will be limited to 8.3 because the further increase in shear strength beyond that 8.3 is not well established so you need to limit the values in your calculations if you are dealing with high strength concrete above 669 megapascal even to 8.3 maximum the ratio of m over v at a particular section may be calculated as if you have the moment diagram and shear diagram you can calculate this ratio very easily greater is the ratio at a particular section of the member fluxual cracks appear quite earlier because m more m means more fluxual stresses and complete modus of rupture will come and crack will appear on the tension side once crack will appear it will reduce the net area to resist shear it means b and d will not be now present to resist the shear force because in shear stress we are using effective area in the denominator consequently the effective shear strength is reduced because area is consumed by the fluxual cracks opening of the initial fluxual cracks may be controlled by providing the greater effective depths up to certain extent obviously you can increase the depth and in turn shear strength may vary as directly proportional to the effective depth so we can say we see concrete shear strength is inversely proportional to m over v however it is directly proportional to effective depth and together we can say that vc is actually proportional to vd over m because when i will take reciprocal it will v will come on in numerator and 
d is also directly proportional so we can say together that the concrete strength in shear is directly proportional to the effective depth and it is inversely proportional to m over v now on this experimental beam when you have third point loading actually you are applying on this beam at two points the load so on the machine you can put a bridge over here and then on that you will put a load over here so in this way you will spread this point load into two components so if it is 2v it will become v and v and the end reactions will also be v so if the two point loads are v the shear force which will be present on the support will be equal to v so it will be positive and it will be negative and in the middle third if i have all the distances a suppose a and a i have divided this beam into three equal segments so this middle third has zero shear force so we call it then a pure bending zone because when i will draw the movement diagram of this beam the movement diagram will be like this a constant movement magnitude will be present in the middle third and there is only movement present here in this middle third while shear force is zero so it is a pure bending zone when this kind of test setup will be applied and load is applied at two points of equal magnitude you will get this conditions this means that the shear strength of the concrete may be considered as inversely proportional to factor m over vd i i have uh, mentioned it on the previous slide so when when it is inversely proportional it means vd over m will become your answer in case of field beams usually subjected to uniformly distributed loads the ratio m over v is to be calculated at the cross section of concern when you have a beam which is subjected to uniformly distributed load you can plot the bending moment diagram it will be the moment profile will be parabolic and then you will draw the shear force diagram it will be linearly varying and at section by section knowing the moment ordinate and the shear force you can get m or v ratios and at the section of concern you will definitely be able to get the ratio between movement and shear however for experiments usually concentrated loads are applied in the laboratory as shown in the figure above in such cases m, m over vd ratio simplifies to shear span over effective depth ratio very important parameter a over d ratio how it simplifies to m over vd let me take you back to this experimental beam what will be the movement over here which is the start of pure bending zone it will be v o into a because v into the span a it will it will become v into a so your maximum movement in this experimental beam is actually v over a the v into a and what is the shear force shear force at this 
point is V. So what will be M over V ratio at this section? It will be V into A over V. So we will be left with only A. And what is the effective depth? It is D. So when we are saying V is proportional to VD over M, so what we have got from M over V, the original was, it is directly proportional to D and it is inversely proportional to M over V. So now what we got M over V, we got for this experimental beam, it is equal to A. So I can put A over here. So it means I can rearrange it like this. It is inversely proportional to A over D. So we started with the discussion that V is directly proportional to D and V is inversely proportional to M over V. And then we, when we combined it together, we got this equation. Now in case of our experimental beam, when I substituted for M over V, my values at the start of middle third section, I got the answer of M over V equal to A. And then when I substituted in my equation, it will become V is directly proportional to D over A or otherwise it is inversely proportional to A over D. So we are left with A only, which is the shear span, the span on which shear force is present, and the effective depth. So M over VD is actually simplified to shear span over effective depth, A over D. So this is what they are stating here, that in case of field beams usually subjected to uniformly distributed loads, you need to calculate this M over V by working out what is M at a section and what is, D at, uh, what is V at that section, and then you will divide them. You will take ratio of M over V to get that value. However, if we want to apply M over V calculation to experimental beam, we have seen in that picture that M over VD ratio simplifies to the shear span over effective depth ratio, which we term as A over D ratio. A means the shear span and D is the effective depth. So what I explained on the picture is again uh, mentioned on this slide that A is the shear span and <coughs> how we will get finally this M over V D. This is actually M over V is A and D is present in the denominator.
now on slide number 17 we want to now relate this a over d with the classification of beams so when in beams you as calculate a over d ratio knowing the shear span and then the effective depth and if in a beam this ratio comes out to be less than or maximum equal to one we will classify them as very short shear spans or we may name them very short shear span beams uh, the good classification may be very short beams and such we use with a over d ratio less than one will show tied arch action at failure so i mentioned in the previous lectures that what will be the governing failure mechanism now this a over d ratio will help us to decide without going into detailed testing and uh, assessment based on this ratio we can anticipate what type of failure this beam will exhibit so very short beams with a over d ratio less than one will show tied arch action at failure in place of beam action failure as in figure below what will happen for beams with a over d less than or maximum equal to one a fictitious arch is shown over here so what will happen if you will have a steel bar in that beam which is anchored at the end with a 90 degree hook or 180 degree bend then this will this steel bar will act as a tie so that is named that is why it is named as tied arch action so this is actually the compression and obviously normal to that there will be diagonal tension and if you have no such anchorage at the end then this diagonal crack once it will propagate it will weaken the anchorage of the straight bar and finally this beam will collapse so for such beams which are very short this anchorage at the end will restrict or will delay the weakening of the anchorage of the reinforcement and as a result you will get some load transfer without sudden anchorage failure so it is stated here inclined cracks joining the load and the support are produced damaging the horizontal shear flow from the longitudinal steel to the compression zone the arch is tight at the bottom by the flexure reinforcement and the final failure mode is commonly the anchorage failure at the ends so in case of your practical beams if you calculate a over d ratio and if it comes out to be less than one you must understand that how this beam will behave rather than beam action it will behave like a tied arch and the tie and the flexure steel will act like the tie and it must be anchored at the ends 
then comes another range when you calculate shear span over effective depth ratio and it comes out to be between 1 and 2.5 we classify them as short shear spans if this one you will use very short now we are using for them short shear span beams short shear spans also develop tide arch action so it means rather than beam action st still in this short shear span beams with a over d ratio between 1 and 2.5 also exhibit arch action after the formation of inclined cracks but the total load is partly carried by this arch and partly by the dowel action of the main reinforcement combined with the mechanical interlocking between the cracked inclined surfaces so now i am talking about a beam in which a over d is between one and two point five. So it is stated that it also carries load partly by this tide arch action. Still, you must be considering that this flexural steel will act like a tie. And not only by this, the load transfer will take place, but also this steel area will act as a dowel. For example, if this is the bar, so crack is diagonal crack is passing through it in a beam so this steel bar area will provide a stitching action to this diagonal crack so we call it dowel action so not only the load transferred from this to the support through this diagonal compression strut but also the shear force will be provided by the dowel action of this main steel and the cracked surface will also have some roughness over here aggregates which are present in the beam coarse aggregates and fine aggregates at the crack they are providing roughness and smooth sliding of the cracked surface will not take place and as a result load in such beams will be partly carried by the arch action partly by that stitching action of the Phalangular steel combined with the interlocking between the cracked inclined surfaces. So, in this way, in such beams, final failure takes place by bond or dowel failure along the phalangular reinforcement or there are chances that such beams may finally fail by shear compression failure what this shear compression failure means 
that in such beams one crack will move further up your compression area is reducing diagonal crack movement up don't forget that you are also requiring c equal to t to get that internal couple between steel and concrete in case of flexural resistance so when crack is moving up your compression block is reducing and eventually crushing will take place on this position when crack has almost consumed the compression block so we call it shear compression failure so cause was the movement of the diagonal crack propagation of the diagonal crack and consumption of the compression block so such beams with a over d between 1 and 2.5 may fail by double failure that your main steel which was flexural steel may be ruptured out and bond finally was dropped to zero or on the compression side bursting of the concrete will take place and shear resistance will be provided partly by the beam arch action partly by this dowel action partly by the friction at the interlocking of the aggregates on the cracked surface so this kind of beam between a over d1 and to 2.5 we classify them as short shear span beams in shear compression failure the inclined crack rises higher into the beam than a flexural crack reduces the compression area and causes crushing of the concrete over the crack actually they want to mention that it is it has uh, almost approached the top surface while the flexural cracks may be over here and we have still the area at this section may be available to develop the compression force but the crack on the other side the diagonal crack tip has even gone higher than the tip of the flexural crack so consumption of the concrete block over that diagonal crack has finally caused the shear compression failure then comes another domain which is between 2.5 to 6 for a over d ratio and we are using the word slender shear span beams so very short short and then slender do not develop arch action and failure occurs purely by flexural shear cracks so this is important announcement that in beams when a over d will get between 2.5 to 6 then what will happen you will get flexural cracks in such beams and then shear cracks will originate from the lateral axis and finally the mergence of flexural and shear cracks will finally take place rather than the tied arch action or the dowel action as we discussed for very short or short shear span beam in slender shear span beams such arch action will not develop and failure will occur purely by flexural shear cracks 
the resistance offered by concrete in shear after the initial crack is only due to mechanical interlocking of the concrete at the crack surfaces and also the double action of the flexural steel horizontal steel so it means in such beams this stitching by the flexural steel and at the cracked surface the interlocking will actually contributes towards the shear strength and then finally comes another range that when a over d will be greater than 6 for such beams we will use the classification very slender shear span beams so starting from very short then short then slender and then very slender such beams usually fail in flexure so governing failure mechanism will be flexure without the formation of even inclined cracks so such beams once you will load them to ultimate you will find that finally the flexure was the cause of failure rather than the diagonal shear cracks so even you may find that hairline cracks may not be even visible in the shear zone and the dominant failure was the flexure failure so keeping in view this a over d ratio as a structural engineer you will be deciding that what type of detailing and what will be the load a transfer mechanism in the beam whether beam will behave as a tide arch or beam action will come so accordingly your detailing should be done and your anticipation regarding the failure mechanism will be more uh, mature if you have in mind the a over d ratio of your design beam longitudinal reinforcement ratio so actually don't uh, forget that we are starting the we are discussing actually these factors on slide number 11 we started with compressive strength then we started discussion on m over v ratio and effective depth from m over v ratio we got the idea about a over d ratio and then based on a over d ratio we started discussion on different type of beams ranging from very short to very slender and then lastly longitudinal reinforcement ratio as we said con factors contributing toward the shear strength was left so longitudinal reinforcement ratio is also contributing towards the double action so smaller steel ratio causes flexure cracks to extend higher into beam and open more this reduces the shear capacity of the remaining section longitudinal steel provides double action and prevents relative vertical movement of the two parts of the beam formed by the inclined cracks so it is actually stitching the two segments or two chunks of the concrete when the bond is present along the length of the flexural steel it also helps to provide more interlocking between the crack surfaces in case of hairline cracks double action ends after splitting of the concrete horizontally at the level of main reinforcement so we can state longitudinal steel also acts as a tie if arch action has to develop for smaller a over d ratios so it means shear strength in reinforced concrete beams is directly proportional with the 
reinforcement ratio. But obviously we can't say that since it is directly proportional, so we should provide more and more steels until we even enter the over-reinforced phylogenal failure. No, that is not acceptable. But within the tension control under reinforced failure uh, as the final failure mode, we have this argument that this steel, which is actually providing us the movement resistance will also contribute towards the development of shear strength by providing the double action. So now it is on slide number 22. You will find one equation which was published in 2011 publication of ACI. And it is important to note that those textbooks which are referring to this older publication will be following this 2011 ACI proposed equation based on test results and experiments. However, in the current 2019 publication of ACI, this 2011 equation is now not referred and they have proposed a new set of equations with the little modification in the estimation of the concrete shear strength. So, but I discussed factors affecting the compressive strength, uh, sorry, factors affecting the shear strength of concrete Those factors, if I summarize them, in this equation we can get some reflection of them in this ACI proposed equation published in 2011 that Vc is directly proportional to the square root of Fc prime. It is directly proportional to the reinforcement ratio. It is inversely proportional to the M over VD ratio. So all of them are present here in this equation proposed. And there was a condition that from this equation, if you get the answer greater than the right hand side, then you will use the right hand side equation. So maximum allowed was 0.29, 29% of under root of C prime into the effective area to determine the shear strength of the concrete. Along with this equation, ACI also proposed so there is some discussion on slide number 23 with regard to application of this equation. So I am just uh, ignoring this discussion, but on this slide, yes, they are mentioning the capacity reduction factor for shear, which is still same, which also indicates that this force is important because failure will be brittle that's the reason it is more strict 0.75 but it also reflects little uh, lack of confidence in prediction of the shear strength because if it is still 0.75 it means that our prediction is not still very much uh, exact and that is the reason we are putting more 
factor of safety in calculation of the nominal shear strength. So nominal will be multiplied with 0.75 to get the ultimate resistance. So it is still same in the latest code. This equation, which was other simplified equation proposed in 2011 publication of ACI to determine the shear strength of concrete is still present in the 2019 publication. So there is no change in application of this equation. So this is why it is simplified equation because this equation on slide number 22 requires the idea about the phylogenal steel area. It demands the shear force, movement magnitude in order to apply it on a section. So on that section, what is the reinforcement ratio? What is the shear force? What is the movement? that is to be calculated in order to get the strength of the concrete to resist shear. However, in this simplified equation, there is no such detailed analysis required. Just 17% of the under root of Fc prime, that's it you will use to determine the shear strength of concrete alternate and easy equation. Lambda is the lightweight aggregate concrete factor. So if you are using normal strength, normal weight aggregate concrete, then lambda will be one. For lightweight aggregate, it will get value less than one because in lightweight aggregate concrete, shear strength will be reduced. So as I said, now since we want to refer to more exact, uh, more latest uh, prediction based on our current publication of ACI. So some textbooks, they have now modified their examples and questions according to this latest equation. Some authors are quite uh, up to mark and they have published a revised edition after the 2019 equation published in ACI code. So I will also apply them and as well as 2011 equations to solve my problem. In this new set of equations, we have two divisions. First thing is, this is to, to calculate the VC for non pre stress, which is our case. We are not discussing pre stressed concrete. We are discussing non pre stressed concrete. So, VC to be calculated for non pre stressed members. We, want, we will be using these equations. Good news is it is stated either of this one in which the first part is same. But along with that, they are putting a second component, which is actually if in that member, which in our case, we are talking about beams, if axial force is also present, and it will then be used as NU and it will be used positive for compression and negative for tension. So in case if on the beam axial force is present, since it is used positive for compression, it will increase the shear strength of the beam if it is having a compression force. And if axial tension is present in the beam, it will decrease the shear strength. But there is a 
uh, you can say direction given underneath that while applying this equation if your answer comes out to be negative for example tension is much higher and you are getting the answer of vc negative because second component is larger than the first they are allowing you that vc shall not be taken less than zero then take it zero rather than putting a negative sign with the capacity of concrete to resist shear so in our problems at the moment we are only discussing the shear force we are not taking into account the axial compression or tension in case of columns we need to consider this as well it is zero at the moment so this becomes exactly the same equation what we have studied what we were uh, discussing in case of 2011 publication of sci now there is also a second equation given here also i will take it zero because at the moment i am not taking into account the axial tension or compression in this equation now they have introduced reinforcement ratio as the parameter to decide the capacity of concrete to resist shear so if 2011 row was present but it was without any exponent here it is present with the power 1 over 3 along with lambda and then it comes out to be under root of fc prime so more simple if i compare it with 2011 publication and it is also mentioned in the first column criteria when you are deciding the steel reinforcement in the concrete beams to resist shear and you are providing shear stirrups and the provided shear stirrup area is greater or minimum equal to the minimum proposed shear stirrup area then this a and b equations are applicable that finally you will be detailing the member with the ties stirrups and the area will be more than minimum required then you can pick up vc from either of a or b and in case you are not providing any shear stirrup or the provided area of shear stirrup is less than the minimum proposed by aci in case no provide provision or minimum provided less than minimum required then this equation will become applicable and you will notice that this equation are and this one is almost same except this lambda s rest of the lightweight aggregate factor rho w reinforcement ratio in the beam and concrete strength square root of it all factors are even 0.66 as a coefficient is same what is lambda s it is stated here it is size affect modification fact what you will do suppose you have a beam with effective depth 250 mm 250 into 0.004 plus 1 what will be the answer the answer will be first let me calculate 250 into 0.004 answer will be 1 1 plus 1 will become 2 so 2 over 2 under root of it 
it will the answer will be one so one less than or equal to one so this means that for all cross sections with d less than or maximum equal to 250 you will get answer less but if suppose now your d is suppose 450 effective depth into 0 0.004 answer will be 1.8 so if d is 450 it will become 1.8 plus 1 it will become 2.8 so lambda s will then be 2 over Two point eight. So when I calculate this two divided by two point eight and I take under root of it, what will be the answer? Can you respond? Let me calculate from my calculator. 2 divided by 2.8 and then I take under root of it So can you can you reply me please if you can use calculator if D is four fifty four fifty into because if I will discard this I my on my screen the writing will be deleted. Excuse me, sir. It is zero point eight five. It is zero point eight five. Good. So it is size effect lambda s is 0.85 so if now you use the value suppose 450 you use 650 and can you calculate again Sir, it is 0 0.75. It is 0 0.75. So, it is mentioned here that when you will be using higher depth beams, your lambda s will start decreasing your VC because it is now well understood after doing test that increase in the strength of the concrete to resist shear will not simply increase by doubling the beam in effective depth that I would say if my beam shear strength for 100 millimeter D is 1 for 200 millimeter D it will become 2. I mentioned in my previous discussion that VC is directly proportional to D. But now in the this modified 
equation proposed in ACI 2019, they have now made this modification and it is mentioned as size effect modification factor to acknowledge that simply by increasing the effective depth does not mean that your VC will be amplified to the same extent that if D is 450, VC will be of some magnitude. If D will be 650, it will simply be multiplied with 650 by 450 and whatever is the ratio for that much amount, the VC will increase. So this modification factor which will give you answer always less than 1 when your, your D will get bigger than 250. But if your D is less than 250, you will get some answer which will be still controlled by the condition that in no case your lambda s will get value more than 1. For example, if you will put D 200 in this equation, so 200 into 0.004, then plus 1 will give you 1.8. So 2 divided by 1.8 and then taking under root of it will give you answer more than 1. But you have to limit it to 1. So for beams which are 250 or below, you have to select lambda s1. And for beams deeper than 250 millimeter, this lambda s will give you a value which will be less than 1. So in this way, you will be limiting your VC based on this size effect modification factor. So this is what they have now proposed. In such beams, to get VC in which either area of shear stirrups is absent, only concrete is there to resist the shear or even if ties are present, their area is less than the minimum proposed by the ACI code. Then in that case, do not blindly increase the VC by increasing the depth, but multiply it with lambda s to reduce by that degree which this coefficient will uh, to, uh, by that percentage which this coefficient will tell you like in your case you have calculated 0.85 or 0.79 so it means you are taking 89% or 79% of that uh, to calculate the role of the effective depth in enhancing the shear strength of the members in which AV is less than or is altogether absent. So when we will solve the problem, we want to make sure that which out of these A, B or C we want to select. Normally if we have planned to provide shear stereos because shear stereos will give us ductile failure against accidental settlements, some you can say construction defects, possibility of uh, bond failures. In all such cases, ties will have their contribution against twist torsional stresses, ties will also play their role. So providing no ties is normally dangerous. So we provide ties and if the ties area provided is more than the minimum proposed by the ACI code, then we will follow either A or B. But in those cases where we are not interested in providing ties or area less than minimum, then we need to refer to this equation C as per the latest guideline. 
and furthermore it is stated vc once you will calculate vc based on these equations a b or c you will not be taking greater than 42% of the under root of fc prime so there is a upper limit that in no case if your answer by applying these equations give you the result point Four five or point six four six hundred FC prime. We need to limit it to point four two. So this is the. It in all cases it should be less than or equal to less than or equal to point four two FC prime. So that is the upper limit. And further in table, this. In case once we have positive or negative axial force, it is further stated that it the value finally what you will get shall not be taken greater than 0 0.05 times FC prime. So once we will discuss columns, then we can discuss this uh, magnitude. So this is what in ACI latest sci code is and on, this is the last slide which i want to cover today in 2009 publication they also have mentioned in chapter 9 for rc beams which are non pre test minimum area of shear reinforcement we were talking about av minimum av minimum on the last slide so what is this av minimum it shall be provided in all regions and Keep in mind when we are talking about beams. For non pistol minimum area of shear enforcement shall be provided in all regions where VU is greater than this 0 0.083 into phi into phi is 0.75, except for the cases in the table below. For these cases, at least AV minimum shall be provided where VU will exceed capacity of ultimate capacity of concrete alone. So this is what we will consider in mind while deciding the AV minimum. That AV minimum shall be provided. So there is a requirement. We can't violate this if we are following ACI code. In all regions where VU will exceed this given upper limit, 0 0.083, except for the cases in the table. For the such cases, they have given you another criteria. For these cases, at least AV minimum shall be provided where VU will get bigger. So otherwise, if VU will get bigger than this, this will be applicable. But except for this cases in the table, for example, for shallow depth beams, which are having H less than 10 inch, for such beams, this equation is not applicable. But for such beams, if VU will get bigger than 5 VC, and VC we are going to calculate based on equations on the previous slide. So if it will exceed, then we will provide this AV minimum. So rest of the cases at the moment are not relevant to us. So it means for all beams less than or equal to to 50 millimeter, this class will become applicable. Otherwise, uh, this we need to consider that VU, if it is greater than 0 0.083, we have to provide the AV minimum. So, so I think at this slide number 27, I may. Let's stop today's lecture. So then the remaining slides I will cover in the 
next online lecture